it's uh, 12 o'clock, we'll get started. Uh, Merry Christmas and happy holidays, everyone. So today we're hoping we can bring some uh, Christmas cheer to everyone to kick off the, um, the holiday season. So we're all Canadians, uh, so Merry Christmas, eh? Uh, my name is Leon hey. Singh. I am a society unit chair at the OPG Local, and I, I'm also the co-chair of the Coalition of Racialized Professionals. This uh, presentation is brought to you by um, Coalition of, of Racialized Professionals and Allies. Uh, I'm one of the facilitators for today, along with uh, Solly Solomon. So Merry Christmas, everyone. Next slide. Okay, so as usual, uh, we'll start our um, presentation off with our Indigenous Territory Acknowledgement. At this time, I'll call on Lilia Schillingford from OED Local to read our land acknowledgement. Over to you, Lilia. Next slide. Slide, please. Much appreciation, regardless of the snowy climate and all of the freezing rain. Um, we wish to acknowledge that this land on which the Society of the United Professional operates for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And we're grateful for this opportunity to live and work here. And we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We also recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this community, our province and country as a whole. And I personally will remain a steward of this land and do all that I can in solidarity with Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, uh, Lilia. At this point, I would like to call on President of the Society of United Professionals to bring us uh, greetings. Michelle, over to you. Thanks, Leon. Yeah, it's uh, my pleasure to join you today to learn about how people across the globe celebrate Christmas, from when and how various Christmas Christians gather for mass to a wide range of culinary and festive traditions. There's so much to learn about how people the world over mark the birth of Jesus Christ. And I wanna thank Leon and the rest of the Coalition of Racialized Professionals team for developing this workshop and their work over the past year. CORP has done a wonderful job of bringing members of all faiths ethnicities and races together to share some of the traditions, histories and cultural practices that make society members proud to be themselves. Creating space to show pride in our respective cultures is itself important, but it is also a gift to those of us here to learn because we get to build our cultural intelligence and find new ways to connect with our colleagues, our communities and the world at large. So on behalf of your society leadership, I want to wish everyone who celebrates a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Joyful New Year. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Michelle. That was, uh, that, that was uh, terrific. Um, so we are also equally honored to have with us uh, the president of the IFPTE and the secretary treasurer of the IFBTE. For those society members who aren't aware, the IFBTE is our uh, parent organization in the US and they have over 80,000 members. They're based out of Washington, DC. So at this point, I'd like to call on Matt Biggs and Gay Henson to bring us greetings from the IFBTE. They're not on yet, Leon. They're actually having a challenge uh, connecting. So we might have to skip this and have them uh, maybe give some comments at the end. I'm working on getting them connected. Okay, that's uh, that's great. Okay, yeah. So we'll move uh, we'll move on to the next. Um... Okay, so we have a very um, we have a very exciting here today. It's uh, it's, it's quite packed. So I, I hope you uh, you stick around, um, enjoy, and learn the 
all about the um, the different ways that Christmas is celebrating and perhaps see some commonalities. Um, we, uh, we're so honored that um, this pres presentation has been put together by uh, members of the society. Um, you know, everyone has uh, worked really hard, so I'd like to acknowledge a couple of folks. So we'll start off with Canada, uh, with Alana Gan Gagnon, who's uh, based out of the Bay in Northern Ontario. Uh, then we'll move to Toronto, the Niagara region. Uh, Lilia will talk a bit about that. And then we start traveling around the world. We'll go to Europe, South America and the Caribbean, Africa, Middle East, and Asia. So just a couple of housekeeping um, notes here. Please uh, make sure that your microphones are muted. Post your comments and questions in the chat. And I'd also like to ask that if you can introduce yourself in the chat, if you're um, comfortable doing that, so you can type in um, perhaps the local that you're from, whether you're an elected rep, delegate, LVP, and perhaps the city that you're from. I'm not sure if we have any uh, other members from uh, from south of the border, but there were a few that were invited. So if you can do that now, that'd be great. Next slide, please. So I wanted you to take a look at this map. So this is a map of the world. And, um, you know, did you know that uh, Christmas, December 25th, is celebrated by over 2 billion people around the world? As you can see, December 25th is a holiday in all of North America, South America, huge parts of Africa, Europe, India, and Australia. It is Christmas is celebrated on January 6th by Armenians, on January 7th by Orthodox, and also on the 7th by Coptic Christians, and that's shown on the map. I'd also like to recognize that there are other parts of um, the world where Christmas is not a holiday. Uh, so that those are um, our brothers in uh, Northern Africa and some parts of Asia. Next slide, please. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to our master of ceremony. Uh, his name is Sali Solomon. He's a society delegate, OPG local. He's a for trans technology and he works in our engineering maintenance and technical training over to you Solly. thank you so much leon thank you for all the flags that you put up there uh, this is christmas all around the world is our society theme for this year as you can see from my background i'm out of this world i'm sitting from uss enterprise so merry christmas to you shalom alehem and live long and prosper to all of you. So uh, before we go to the different countries, we are going to go to the first Christmas 2000 years ago in Israel. And we are going to learn about the first Christmas together through trivia. And as uh, when we see who's uh, giving us the correct answer the fastest, society is going to give you the Christmas goodies and we'll get in touch with you to get your address to send it to you. So let's get started. So Chris, if we can go to the next slides, Christmas around the world. Question one, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Okay, Michael Bisnoth, uh, you get the first prize. Okay. So somebody, uh, we will review this because it's recorded. So as you can see from Matthew 2, 1, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. And we are going right now to question number two. If you can put it on, please. One of Jesus' title is Emmanuel. What's the meaning of it? Right. So who answers A the fastest? Was Michael also? Is that okay, Michael, if we give it to Janice because we have <laughs> one present per person? Okay, Janice Lou, you got it right. The answer is in the next slide. 
Matthew 1, 22, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The whole premise of Christmas that God is not far away, that God came to the world to save us. God saves us is Emmanuel. And we are going to go to question three right now. What is the first thing that the angels say to the shepherds? B, C, A. Who answered C the fastest? You can see above. Can I see? Who yeah, answered we, C? We'll always go back in the chat, Sully. And, uh, and okay, that. we can always go back to the chat. All right, so go to the next slide, please, uh, Chris. Look to 10. Do not be afraid. So go back, please. <laughs> Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people because angelic beings are so awesome in appearance. People are scared. So the first thing they always say is do not be afraid before they say all the good news of being rejoicing and good news and so on. Okay. And then question number four. There it is. The first Santa Claus is? We have lots of deeds, so I think we have to... All right, Bishop from Turkey. In fact, he used to give money in kids' shoes uh, when he uh, when he was alive, and uh, in the, uh, several occasions, he even bailed or redeemed children from being sold to prostitution. So that's the answer, Bishop from Turkey. We are ready for question number five right now. The first company that commercialized co uh, Santa Claus is? I think I saw a D, so we have the correct answer. All right. Next, Chris, it's Coca-Cola. Absolutely. So uh, this is our message today. So Christmas blessings to all of you. Peace, joy, love, and hope. Now we are going to go all around the world. Next, Chris. Christmas in Canada, we are going to welcome Alana, Society Unit Director from, from Thunder Bay, Ontario. Go ahead, Alana. Floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Chris, you can go to the first slide. So Canada is such a multicultural country that holiday traditions from all over the world are celebrated here. The traditional Canadian Christmas varies from province to province, family to family, and draws on many European traditions, often with a sprinkle of First Nation traditions. I know that there are many cultural celebrations around this time of year, but I'm going to focus on the traditionally Christian version of the season. So my family roots in Canada are long-standing, with my French, Irish, and Norwegian ancestors arriving in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and all of them brought their own traditions. I myself was born in Quebec, and for most of my childhood, my extended family lived in Quebec, and so a lot of our traditions are Quebec-based. Having spent the majority of my adult life here in Thunder Bay, I've also been privy to Italian, Finn, and German traditions. For Christian Canadians, Christmas is celebrating the birth of Jesus and it includes traditions and rituals surrounding that event. Next slide, please, Chris. So in terms of getting ready for Christmas, there's trees, lights, wreaths, candles, ornaments, of course. Um, Christmas trees are, are uh, cut your own or artificial. For many years here in this house, uh, we cut our own. It's a bonus of living with lots of forest around you. The boys and I would go out for the afternoon, trek around in the bush and pick the perfect tree, cut it and, uh, bring it home on top of whatever car we happened to have. I remember my parents bringing home a huge tree that kind of covered their whole car. They had a little green car at the time and all you could see was tree with wheels. I have some pictures of that somewhere. I should have included it. Uh, of course, everybody decorates their house, lights, inflatables, manger scenes, Santa on the roof, ornaments, and ornaments are often passed down through generations. Many people celebrate with a Santa Claus parade. Almost every city I can think of has one and some cities even have a separate parade of lights. For Christians though, getting ready for Christmas means Advent and in particular, the Advent wreath. So the wreath is a German tradition uh, coming from both Lutheran and Catholic backgrounds. The circle represents eternity 
and the four or five candles represent some aspect of the preparation for, for Jesus' birth. The candles are lit once a week for four weeks before Christmas. There are three purple and one pink representing prophecy, Bethlehem, the shepherds and the angels, with the center white Christ candle lit on Christmas Eve. Next slide, please, Chris. Of course, Christmas is about food. I don't know any family that Christmas is not about food and sharing food. So in southwestern Nova Scotia, families eat lobster and shellfish caught off the shores of Nova Scotia and in the North Atlantic Ocean on Christmas Eve. And many of my friends I know have uh, continued this tradition even here in Thunder Bay, having a seafood smorgasbord on Christmas Eve. In the Maritimes, there are Christmas sweets called barley candy and chicken bones. They're made by local candy companies. Barley candies are usually um, a bit like a lollipop and they're shaped like Santa or reindeer or snowmen or Christmas trees. Chicken bones are actually pink candies that taste like cinnamon and have a chocolate filling. There's a large Ukrainian community in Canada, the third largest in the world actually following uh, the Ukraine and Russia. And Canadian families will have the traditional 12 meal dishes for Christmas. For Quebecers or those of French descent, descent there's the bouche de Noël or the chocolate log. In my family, we have a buckle making tradition. Buckles or fatigma are a Scandinavian cookie. They're sweet, full of sugar and heavy cream and cognac and brandy and cardamom. And in my family, what we do is it's a tradition to spend the day making buckles assembly line style leading up to Christmas. We keep them in tins, share them at Christmas, give them as gifts. And of course, good old fruitcake, stolen panettone, Figgy pudding, whatever you call it, that stuff lasts forever. Next slide, please. So with all the preparations from the food to decorations through the pain or joy of Christmas shopping, the big day arrives. Here in Canada and around the world, children put out milk and cookies for their Père Noël, Kris Kringle, Yolo Puki, Weine Schnacksman, Babo Natale, whatever you call him, he's Santa, and they look forward to what he can bring. Although the Finlanders among us might argue, it is widely agreed that Santa actually lives in Northern Canada. Canada Post even answers letters from Santa and children can send those letters to Santa, North Pole, H-O-H-O-H-O. -H -O -H -O. Christian Christmas is centered around the birth of Christ. Children participate in the Christmas pageant at church, often at family masses in early evening on Christmas Eve or as part of the solemn and beautiful midnight mass. Many families open their gifts on Christmas Eve, leaving just the stockings for Christmas morning, and some open one gift before midnight mass. Christmas Day itself is about family, gathering to drink eggnog, rum laden for the adults, and open presents in the morning, followed by meal prep, setting the table, and celebrating with turkey, goose, ham, duck, and all the trimmings. Next slide, please, Chris. After Christmas, of course, is Boxing Day. And for all the things we associate with Boxing Day, for many Christians, it is also the first day of the traditional 12 days of Christmas, with the Feast of Epiphany falling at the end of those 12 days. Epiphany commemorates the visits of the Magi, or wise men, to the baby Jesus, and is one of the three principal and oldest festival days for the Christian church. I have to say that in doing a little research for this presentation, it was kind of fun to realize how many of my own family's traditions came from other cultures. And now with my family spread across Canada, it seems that we find a new tradition every year to add. And I think that's the most Canadian thing of all. Next slide, please, Chris. So from my family to yours, I wish you all the perfect balance of joy and peace this season. And thank you. Thank you. Please give Elena a big round of applause. And we can go to the next speaker, Lilia Schillingford, to share with us Christmas in Toronto and Niagara Falls. She's a society member with Ontario Energy Board Local. Go ahead, Lillian. Thank you and Merry Christmas, everyone. Um, Toronto and the surrounding areas, the GTA outside of Toronto, um, we're thrilled every year to have the backdrop of so many lights and activities happening in our city. Um, especially in um, areas like the Palvocate of Lights at Nathan's Phillips Square, at Canada's Wonderland, at Cross Loma, our whole city lights up. And the Christmas lights represent um, that Christ is the light of the world. So there's tons of stuff to do around the holiday and many lights to observe and enjoy and that serve as a perfect backdrop to Christmas. 
um, get kicked off by the Toronto Santa Claus Parade, where all the children have a wonderful time looking at all the different floats. And we're so happy that um, Santa Claus Parade is back after COVID. And then the cavalcade of lights at Nathan Phillips Square is really accessible to people living in Toronto. You can also skate under the lights, um, have some hot chocolate, and there's Canada's Wonderland Winterfest, which is a wonderful celebration of Christmas, and Casa Loma, which is a romantic, um, wonderful place to be, and then the Toronto Christmas Market for your last minute gifts, and really unique and special items that you can find there. And then um, for people like my mom who are green thumbs and flower addicts, there's the Christmas flower show at the Allen Gardens. Um, I think it's on Leslie. And then a wonderful, wonderful tradition in my family, um, especially my mom was a manager at Hutton's Bay Company, um, is to enjoy the beautiful display um, and walk around and just take in, you know, all the artfully created ambiance for us with the Hudson Bay Holidays window display at the Eaton Center. And this year, I believe it'll be even, it'll even be more special um, that the Eaton Center isn't having their traditional Christmas tree. So I'm sure that the Hudson Bay Center this year um, will be even a more beautiful and meaningful experience for us all. Thank you and everyone enjoy the holiday season. How about the Niagara Falls, uh, Lilia? Yes, the Niagara Falls lights. Um, Niagara Falls has such a really wonderful tradition of highlighting um, different celebrations, but especially at Christmas time, it's really special um, with the lights. Um, you know, so bright and beautiful. And of course, um, thanks to Ontario Power Generation who hosts the Festival of Lights. And as well, um, even like I think um, Alana mentioned that, you know, different areas of Toronto and the GTA celebrate in different ways. And if, even in Markham, you'll find um, beautiful light display. I think it's at the Markham Fairgrounds, um, but all these um, areas just remind us of, you know, the beauty and we're able to build memories with our family as a child. I remember, you know, a father packing us up in the car and driving around to different neighborhoods to look at the lights. And I am glad that this continues to be a tradition um, for all of us in Canada. Um, so if I've forgotten anything, please remind me, Solly, but I think that covers it all um, in terms of bringing light into the holiday season. We'll find it all around us. All we have to do is to get in our cars, weather permitting, and enjoy all what the season offers. Thank you so much, uh, Lillian. That's a beautiful Thank presentation. You. Now we are welcoming Eric Rasmussen to discuss Christmas in Sweden. He is a society member from OPG Local. Go ahead, Eric. There we go. Hello, everyone. Um, jag heter Erik Rasmussen. That is my name and how you present yourself in Swedish. I would like to just show you a little bit of where Sweden is in case you forgot because we're always competing against Canada in hockey. My memory is that we usually win, but I could be a little bit flawed on that one. As you can see, Stockholm, the capital city of Sweden, is very high up in Canada. Uh, and Toronto is basically in the southern part of Europe. Uh, give me a click here, Chris. And you will I see that Copenhagen, where my hometown is, is very uh, just basically close to the Copenhagen one. I uh, just want to let you know that I moved to Canada in 2003. I've been working with OPG for 17 years and nuclear for 32 years. And we moved on. That's okay, Chris. Leave it there. Uh, Christmas in Sweden is dark uh, during Christmas. The days are dark and short. We moved the picture on that one. Uh, the Christmas display in the capital city, you can see it's bright. Uh, we have a very nice tradition in Sweden. We build one of the world's biggest eulogos. I, or uh, um, Gete Bok, 
Uh, it's, it's very famous because not only is it because of the size, because people like to burn it down. Out of the 55 years it has been built, uh, it has remained standing for 16 years. Uh, people are crashing cars into it, they're burning it down. We now have fences, security guards, web cameras, fire retardant material, and somehow people still manage to get that burnt down. Uh, next slide. Um, <clears throat> the Christmas tradition. I think this is one of the most important things is uh, on December 24th, uh, Santa comes to your house. He actually shows up, doesn't sneak in, doesn't climb down the chimney, doesn't uh, uh, leave with traces of crumbs and milk. Santa knocks on the door, asks if there's any nice kids in the house. And if the parent says yes, they will enter with all the, all the presents in the bag and they will sit down and hand it out. Usually Santa is the dad of the house or a male a relative. Uh, what they have done is that they usually say, uh, I need to go and buy the paper. Honestly, I don't know what excuse to make nowadays because the paper is almost out of, like we didn't, who reads the paper nowadays? Um, after uh, Santa has left, the male returns and go, oh, did I miss Santa again? It took me 12 years to figure out that that was my dad. That's just, just so you know, it took some time. Um, hint, it was his watch. He forgot to take off the watch and that's how I recognized him. Um, what I wanna do now, next slide, is instead of you listening to me, December 13th it is a very important date in Sweden where we celebrate Lucia or Lucia. Uh, it is a tradition that is extremely strong and I would like for you to take two minutes of watching this video and uh, I will continue on after that. Let's go. December 13 isn't a date in Sweden, it's Lucia. On this day, two things are inescapable. A, it's cold and B, it's dark. To fight the dark, light was needed. The Lucia tradition can be traced back to St. Lucia of Syracuse in Italy. No wonder Swedes celebrate her every year. According to old heathen and pagan myths, this was a night when evil dark spirits liked to roam and animals became possessed and started to talk. But as usual in Sweden, when it comes to traditions, the why is less important than the how. The first thing you need to do is to make Lucy Buller or saffron buns. A saffron is a controlled substance and only sold at supermarket counters. Everyone cheats on the ginger biscuits, the pepper cocker in Swedish, and buys the pre-made dough. Advanced bakers and show-offs make gingerbread houses too and put them out on Facebook. Make sure you have some plonk handy for mulled wine or glug as the Swedes call it. Pour in your spices and then watch it like a hawk so it doesn't boil or Lucia won't be quite as much fun. Lucia fronts a band of singing handmaidens, Santas, star boys and gingerbread men. But don't feel bad if you're last in line in a brown one piece, everyone serves a purpose. From dawn to dusk, processions take place in homes, schools, churches, hospitals and offices and bring tears to most people's eyes. One of the catchiest numbers is the tip-tap song. But what really gets you in the Christmas spirit is the theme tune, Sang to Lucia. Only Lucia gets to wear candles in her hair, the rest have to carry theirs. The ever-cautious Swede goes for fake candles these days. Less fires that way, especially in daycare centres. It's practically impossible not to attend at least one Lucia procession. Your colleagues, neighbours, children will make sure of that. Or there's Sweden's Lucia on TV. Every year, Sweden votes for its favourite Lucia in a nationwide contest. Although the winner isn't judged on her voice, she must love children and, of course, desire world peace, just like Miss World. If you can't make it to Sweden at this time of year, by all means try it at home or head to a Swedish embassy, consulate or church to see the pros in action. Thank you, Chris. That was fantastic. Uh, that brings back memories. 
uh, it is uh, it is such a joy to see that again uh, because I grew up with that. I was part of that. I was always the gingerbread man. One year I got to be the star boy. Um, Christmas celebrations. I want you to be aware that in Toronto we have approximately five thousand Swedes, uh, or as part of the Swedish community. And every year we celebrate uh, 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 Christmas by having a Christmas fair, and it's open for the public. There's a link in this in this uh, presentation, and you will see the Lucia, you will see the Swedish folk dances, you can buy Swedish candy and food, and you will be able to participate in the culture. It's a it's not very well known, so I wanted to give you the opportunity to participate in that if you have your ways around Toronto. Uh, now I'm going to leave you with some Swedish Christmas words just for the fun of it. Merry Christmas is good jul, Santa tomte, snow snö, and a Christmas present, which I hope you all will get a lot of jul klapp. Thank you very much, and a Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you so much, Eric. Looking forward to see the uh, ever cautious uh, Swedish, right? Now we are moving to England, so we are going to invite Nicola Van Dam, a society member from OPG Local. Thank you. Go ahead, Nicola. Thanks very much, Sully. And happy Christmas to everybody and welcome to England. I was born and raised in London, England, moved to Canada in 1996. And as you can see on this slide, there is a lot of great tourist attractions that are lit up all throughout the festive season. Here we've got Tower Bridge, Big Ben, the Houses of Parliament, the London Eye, and one of those favorite uh, photo op moments, the old telephone booths, which now they do exist, but I'm not quite sure that anyone actually uses them anymore and they are quite sparse around London. So moving to the next slide. I thought I would share in some of the Christmas traditions that I took part in as a child raised in Southeast London. As you can see from the map, I didn't live that far from uh, central London. So uh, in, on the right hand side of the map there, you'll see a little town called Plumstead. And for us at that time, it was one bus ride into central London, which was a big deal for my sister and I, because my mum would take us on the bus and it, to go up London to see the Christmas lights. And that would involve a day of Christmas shopping where we would visit Hamley's which is one of the biggest toy stores in the world. It's about six floors of toys and they put on the most amazing window displays. And so all of the chatter around the schools would be who has seen the Hamleys window display yet. Uh, another thing that we would do is go to one of the other major department stores, probably Selfridges, if my memory serves me correctly, to visit Santa's Grotto. Santa's Grotto would be this you know, little made up house, if you will, where it looked like Christmas exploded with the tackiest uh, of decorations that you could find and you would navigate through, see a couple of elves and then eventually make it on to Father Christmas's knee. Now you may have noticed that I use the term Father Christmas that is because typically for in England that is what we refer who how we refer to Santa Claus but just to confuse everybody it's Santa's grotto but we go and visit Father Christmas in Santa's grotto. Don't ask me why. So how we would uh, go about our day, we would go visit Father Christmas, we would visit the windows, and then we would be back on the bus just as it was getting dark as we navigated our way on the bus ride across London to see the lights. So next slide, please. I thought I would share some of the other activities that are still remain very prevalent today in the UK. We've already heard of the story of uh, the nativity and I went to a Church of England primary school where every year we would put on the nativity play. A couple of times I was, uh, I was an angel in the nativity play and what was interesting about that is uh, only the angel Gabriel was given a sheet to put over themselves. I got to to wear a tunic made out of paper um, with a bit of tinsel on my head. So um, I was a little disgruntled in that moment because it was, it was quite cold. Um, but the nativity is something that uh, is uh, people partake in, be it go through the, uh, the uh, house of religion or through the schools, because uh, a, a lot of schools still do put those on to date. 
The Snowman. This is an animated film that was made in 1982. So a child of the 80s or 90s it would not be Christmas if you hadn't yet watched The Snowman it's all animated there are no words it's all simply to music it's about half an hour long and this is something that uh, whether my children like it or not I make them watch it every year now uh, also Charles Dickens A Christmas Carol so you see I've put the book on the slide here but it's not necessarily you know not everybody reads it every Christmas but at some point you've either watched Mickey's Christmas Carol a Muppet's Christmas Carol or you have done a Dickensian walk through Rochester with your candles and done some carol singing with people dressed up in Victorian clothing uh, so in some fashion uh, people consume the story of A Christmas Carol written by Charles Dickens. And finally, another big treat through the festive season is to go see a pantomime. And I know that these do uh, exist in Canada because that is something that, again, a tradition I've carried over here that I take my children to go see a pantomime. So this is a, a silly play typically based on a fairy tale where you have an array of characters in the event that you were privileged enough to go see the one in central London though at Christmas time. Time, there would be a celebrity or two that would be pretty exciting to see on the stage uh, in the play. So those are some of the activities uh, that I participated in, participated in as a child and also continue today. And then next slide. So we've already heard about some of the food um, and I thought it was important to share that Christmas morning, we were not allowed to open a present, not allowed to open our stockings until my parents had had a cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit made by my sister and I. And I'm pretty sure that there are lots of other English children that had the same uh, expectation of them. Cup of tea is a must before you do anything to start the day, which is probably why I now have an aversion to tea. Um, and so after we, uh, parent, our parents had a cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit, we would open our presents and open our stockings and breakfast would consist of a bacon sandwich um, or, or a bacon butty if you will if it was on a bun and then as the day goes on you're consuming a variety of different treats probably from your selection box because Christmas isn't Christmas without an abundance of chocolate um, and so you may uh, continue to uh, partake in that now the uh, Christmas dinner You'll see here some of the traditional foods for a Christmas dinner in England is roasted potatoes. You've got uh, stuffing there. You've got pigs in blanket, along with your turkey and your vegetables and Brussels sprouts. Whether you liked it or not, there was going to be Brussels sprouts on your plate. You may notice as well that the Yorkshire pudding is missing on this plate. That's probably because there was never enough room to put the Yorkshire pudding on the plate. There was always too much food. So you'd either sit it on top and pour the gravy on or you would just wait until you made a little bit of room uh, after you've pushed the Brussels sprouts to the side. So Quality Street, I see there was a pop up in the chat for the Quality Street. Now, this was something that as a child, I got a little disgruntled about because we, we would buy these tins of sweets and it would be a big deal and they would sit there and you weren't allowed to touch them because they're for Christmas, you know. But then after, you know, Christmas Day and you've had all of this food and you've had your Christmas pudding, which you can see you pour brandy over and you light it up and you and you have your have it with your cream, ice cream or custard after you've had all that food all day. And then your mum would turn around and say, you can have a sweet now if you want. And at that point, the idea of a quality street just, you know, it was like, do I try? Do I try to overdo it? But uh, it's, uh, that was one thing that now um, I'm, I'm a little more generous with my children uh, to let them open the, open the sweets as long as it's around the Christmas season. I don't make them wait till Christmas Day because at that point you just don't want any more. Thank you very much and happy Christmas to you all. Thank you, Nicola. Now I have one more thing on my bucket list, the Hamley's Toy Store. Now we are moving to another country in Europe, Estonia. So Eric Tisler is the society di unit director in Bruce Power. Go ahead, Eric. Let's welcome Eric. Thank you and welcome everyone. 
Christmas in Estonia. I'm uh, a unit director with Bruce Local, a reactor simulator specialist, proud Canadian Estonian, uh, and the result of uh, grandparents that had to leave Estonia in 1945 due to an un involuntary Russian occupation or infestation. So um, they immigrated with 20,000 others uh, to a wonderful safe haven we call Canada. Uh, living in peace for over 60 years. So thank you, Canada, for, for providing us a wonderful place to celebrate Christmas and, and, and spend our lives in. Next slide, please. How do you say it? Well, we say, Heid Yorubi, which is uh, Merry Christmas, and uh, one of the oldest languages uh, available these days. And uh, I didn't know what it meant uh, when I was younger because I didn't, I, I, I didn't speak Estonian fluently at the time. But it was always a beautiful day when we stepped through our grandparents' uh, uh, front door and said, hey, Yorubi. So uh, next slide. So for those of you that don't know uh, where Estonia is, it's, uh, I like to say that we're the hobbits of Europe. Um, we, we live in a small country of about 1.3 million people. Um, we have the, the, the Finns and the Swedes that make better swords than us there, the elves, if we start to talk about Lord of the Rings comparisons, uh, of course, Germany and France and the UK and Poland, that's all Middle Earth. And then, of course, uh, we fully understand the issues that Ukraine has right now, um, repeating history, repeating itself, Russia um, and the Soviet Union uh, would be considered Mordor. So, um, and we, we have a blue, black, and white uh, flag, uh, which we proudly uh, fly, and uh, um, and uh, they have different meanings, of course. Blue is for the clear skies, uh, black is for the fertile soil, and white is for winter snow. Um, we are on the same elevation as, as Sweden. So, um, next slide, please. So this is the uh, uh, Tallinn uh, town square uh, in Estonia. Every year there's a Christmas market. Um, most notably, the, uh, the most uh, mostly Lutheran uh, religion, although there is an Orthodox component as well. Um, and every year people flock uh, to this Christmas market um, and, and, and the townspeople uh, enjoy uh, different traditions. So we'll get more to that in just a moment. Next square, please. So we're going to talk today about the true origin of the Christmas tree, uh, which is highly debated. But um, contrary to common belief, the Germans did not invent Christmas. The Swedes did not invent uh, the Christmas tree, sorry. And especially the Latvians. Uh, the Latvians and, 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 Eston and Estonians have had a longstanding debate, and we'll get into that right now over the origins. Um, next slide, please. Um, yes, it is a rivalry. I mean, uh, uh, this is an important piece of Christmas that uh, we uh, hold on to, but legend has it that the first Christmas tree was brought to uh, Tallinn's town uh, hall square in 1441 by the Livonian Brotherhood of Unmarried Merchants and Ship Owners. Um, funnily enough, next slide. Is that um, Dunlin's Christmas tree was the first publicly displayed Christmas tree in Europe? However, I have a uh, an argument with my local vice president Dave Chexters, uh, who is, resembles that little angry elf there, Latvian elf. That uh, his claim is that Riga is actually the capital city of Latvia that laid the claim to this event occurring at the same time. But clearly, they're wrong. Uh, I see another claim of uh, Ugandans. So. The uh, funny part about Christmas in 1441 was that we didn't have Christmas tree lights, so they would dance around the tree and then set it on fire. Um, so it was just a temporary, I guess, Christmas tree. Um, now, in terms of family traditions, which continue on to this day, even in Canada, uh, if you can get your hands on it, to, are the... Uh, is our Christmas Eve feast. So it's just like Sweden and a lot of Nordic or Scandinavian countries. We actually celebrate Christmas uh, Eve and uh, that's when we have our traditional meal. So um, it's usually roasted potatoes, pearl barley sauerkraut, which is absolutely delicious, um, root vegetables and our own special Christmas sausage. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. 
I see I added some animations there. Um, so we call this uh, verivorstid, which is uh, a, a blood sausage. A lot of cultures actually enjoy that as well. I know in the French Canadian side of me, uh, it's called boudouin, and, uh, and there's different variations, but um, it's a mixture of uh, pork, barley, uh, blood, and spices. And uh, uh, although we have a, a non uh, uh, vegetarian uh, option available these days, that's uh, just as delicious, just not uh, that color. So um, that's a significant thing if you can show up to your family's uh, dinner with a couple links of this uh, rare and uh, and uh, and and very very um, memorable taste of marjoram as the main component spice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Christmas Eve, just like Sweden and other Nordic uh, countries, Father Christmas or Yoluvana uh, comes to to visit after the Christmas feast on Christmas Eve. So uh, family members must sing a song or recite a poem in order to receive a gift. Um, and that had been going on in my family for decades, but we had a special rule of Father Christmas. If he sounds like a close family member, like an uncle or a grandfather, you did not say anything um, because your gifts could be taken, taken away if you tried to falsely identify them. So, um, so we never did. And, uh, uh, and and strangely enough, uh, grandfather would come back, uh, you know, maybe 20 minutes after Santa or Yolubana had appeared and uh, and uh, there was always a stack of gifts waiting for him to open. So um, next slide, please. So family traditions, Christmas morning. Um, the children got to play with their toys that were already opened, which was fabulous. I felt that we always had an advantage over some of the, our Canadian counterparts because we had already gone through that process and we we're assembling our Legos uh, at six o'clock in the morning while the adults recovered from the previous night's festivities, which usually involved some beverages. Next slide, please. So that's all I have to present today in terms of uh, Christmas in Estonia. Um, there's a lot more, um, including uh, some of the more religious aspects, but I thought I'd concentrate on a few things, uh, such as the Christmas tree origin and uh, the, uh, the traditions of, of Christmas Eve. So uh, to you and yours, a safe and happy Christmas. Heid Yolubuhi. Heid Yolubuhi. Thank you, Eric. Now... We are going to move to Czech Republic. I am inviting Marta Ellen, society delegate from OPG Local. Go ahead, Marta Ellen. Okay. Vesele Vanoce, that's the Merry Christmas in Czech. And I'm Marta Allen, instructional designer of the CVT NGET development section at OPG Local. Uh, altogether, we're a group of about nine people of diverse backgrounds and talents. And we have a new university co-op student every year. And that keeps our group forward thinking. I'm originally from a country that was a lot bigger and not democratic, Czechoslovakia. That was in the 1960s and 70s. Today, Czechia is about half its size geographically, and its population is about 11 million, about the size of Southern Ontario. Czech people are very similar to Canadians as hockey is their religion. A fact of note is that Czechia has the most castles per capita of all European countries, and we can have an argument about that. While it is a nominally Christian country, 80% of the people do not practice any faith, being communist for over 40 years until 1989, which is the year of the Velvet Revolution. Christmas traditions are more cultural than religious. Czechia is a temperate climate with some mountainous regions, but climate change has affected it too. So it can have very hot summers and cold snowy winters. 
it has officially changed to the euro, despite being part of the uh, European common market. Uh, so when Czechia, when in Czechia, the corona or crown is king, not euro. Next slide, please. Christmas traditions in Czechia start early in December with December 5th, the St. Nicholas Day, which is called Miklas in our Czech language. The trio of characters is St. Nicholas, the devil, and the angel. Locals dressed up and walk around Christmas markets talking to children and their parents about the good or bad deeds they have done over the past year. The parents have a list. Based on the list, then St. Nicholas gives the children candy if they have behaved well, or giving them a lump of coal if they have behaved badly. The children then explain themselves or recite a poem because the devil is a threat to them to be taken away from their parents. Kids love to be scared, so it's all in good fun. In Czechia, Christmas is celebrated on December 24th, and presents are put under the tree during dinner by baby Jesus, and it's called Ježíšek. According to tradition, the opening of presents is usually done after dinner in the evening. Also traditionally, families do not eat meat on December 24th, and it is usually fish. Traditionally, a carp which when we lived in Czech, my parents kept uh, alive in the bathtub uh, until the preparation on December 24th. Yeah, we didn't have a shower for a while. Uh, the fish is usually fried with potato salad for dinner. Cookie baking is a tradition. There are elaborate recipes handed down in families. During and after opening the presents, these are consumed with beverage of choice. Toward the late evening on December 24th, many families attend a midnight mass, even if they are not religious. Many churches are filled on that one night. Next slide, please. On December 25th, Families would meet in one house with relatives for the roast bird, traditionally roast goose or duck served with dumplings and cabbage. Also other Czech Christmas food like strudel, uh, cookies and vanochka, uh, which is the sweet bread, which I make every year. Uh, this day is called uh, Božíhod or St. Martin's Day. Currently in our house on December 25th, we eat fish and potato salad. We generally look for local fish and we leave the presents until December 25th. And instead of roast goose, we've changed to the Canadian turkey. And in honor of our grandfathers and fathers, we always have Czech apple strudel for Christmas. The prep for work for all these traditions takes hours and a few days ahead. So um, I tend to relax on Christmas Day. Uh, I mean, Boxing Day, the day after, and I crash. And that is my presentation. And enjoy. Have a peaceful Christmas. Vesele Vánoce a šťastný boží hod. Thank you, Marta Ellen. We are going to Guyana, so Leon, uh, please share your uh, Christmas tradition. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone. So now we've uh, moved from Europe and we're heading down to South America. So um, my presentation today, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, everyone. I'm Leon. I work in nuclear training, uh, Society Unit Director, OPG Local. <clears throat> So my pre presentation is about Christmas in Guyana. So Guyana is located in the northeast corner of South America. Uh, many people confuse it with uh, being part of the Caribbean, but it's actually uh, part of mainland South America. Uh, it is the only English speaking country in South America. And that uh, may be the reason why there is confusion. Uh, we tend to associate more with uh, countries in the Caribbean. It has a population of about 800,000, very small. 
its capital is Georgetown, Guyana. Uh, as you can see, our flag is very colorful. Uh, there are six ethnic groups. It is a very diverse, for a small country, it is a very ethnically diverse nation. It um, has uh, six uh, main groups, uh, indigenous, African, Indian, Portuguese, Chinese, and European, and actually have three of those ancestry uh, is part of my background. I'm not gonna tell you what they are, but perhaps you can guess. Guyana is also famous for having the tallest single drop waterfall in the world. It's known as Kaichor Falls. Its height is about 4.5 times Niagara Falls, and it's twice that of Victoria Falls in Africa. Next slide, please. So there are many um, uh, traditions in Guyana. Um, one of these that I'm quite familiar with. So I spent the first uh, 10 years uh, living in Guyana before my family migrated to Canada in the 1970s. Uh, so one is called Masquerade. So Masquerade at Christmas. So this is where kids and uh, folks will dress up and they will um, dance, uh, sing songs and come to your house. Um, if they're really good, you might give them food but most of the time you give them money, you would give them coins, perhaps the loose changes that you have. So masquerade is a very popular uh, Christmas uh, tradition. People also spend time at the beach. We have um, some, some great be beaches. Um, a lot of them are undeveloped, so they're, they're very natural. Um, the Amazon rainforest is also largely undes um, undestroyed. So it's a very natural uh, beauty uh, there. Uh, one of the, the other things that I do remember, so Santa Claus, we call, we also call it Father Christmas from our British um, uh, tradition. So Father Christmas arrives on a truck. So instead of uh, him arriving on a sleigh, he um, arrives on a, a flatbed truck. So I do remember standing along the side of the road and Santa will toss candy to the kids. So that was always a, a really um, enjoyable time. And the music, of course, playing very loudly. Next slide, please. So another uh, great Christmas tradition is Christmas foods in Guyana. Um, families uh, do go to church um, at Christmas Eve and you know we've heard about the Lutheran church. So oddly enough, um, I was raised in a Lutheran uh, church in Guyana for the first 10 years. Um, later on, uh, we went to a Baptist church in Canada, but uh, I do lo love all of the singing, the caroling. Um, another uh, great tradition is families will, would gather and sing Christmas carols at home. And that's one of the traditions that we continue on is um, every Christmas, uh, the week or weekend before or the weekend uh, uh, or two weekends before we all gather, we get our guitars together and we sing Christmas carols. And it always seems to end up with uh, kind of a Caribbean style of Christmas um, uh, melody. So there's some important foods to talk about. So one of this is an indigenous food. It's called pepper pot. Um, it's actually not uh, spicy with pepper, but uh, it is an indigenous food. It was um, invented by the uh, Amerindians, so the natives um, from the Amazon, and it has a secret ingredient that's known as casrib, which uh, preserves the meat that it's cooked in. So this meat can be left out for over a week without uh, spoiling. And so we usually cook it a week before we have it on Christmas Eve and we have it with homemade bread. There's also a famous um, cake, so Guyanese black cake. So black cake is a cake that's infused with- Just sleeping. Or soaked with rum and uh, sherry or wine. And it's usually uh, soaked a month ahead of time and then it's, uh, it's cooked wonderful. It just melts in your mouth. Garlic pork is a um, Portuguese um, tradition that uh, was brought to Guyana and it's also uh, famous around Christmas time. And we also have another famous dish just known as uh, cook up, which is kind of the Caribbean version of jambalada. Uh, peas and rice, delicious melts in your mouth. Um, and some famous drinks here is what's one that's known as mobi, which is um, made from the bark from an Amazon tree. Uh, very, um, very delicious, sweetened with sugar and drank at Christmas time and also Sorrel drink. So that concludes uh, my presentation. Um, next.
Thank you so much, Leon. So don't eat and drive when you consume the rum cake, okay? So now I'm going to bring in uh, ID from uh, Brazil, who's cheering for Argentina for the soccer right now. So welcome, ID Society member from OPT Local. Go ahead, ID. Yeah, yeah, that is so true. You know, I'm ID Guimaraes. I'm uh, from a CBT development group uh, in the media content development and designing things. And, and then, uh, okay, uh, Merry Christmas, we say Feliz Natal. E Happy New Year, we say Prospero Ano Novo, that means a prosper year. You know, uh, my background is a Baptist. I've been on Baptist church since forever. Then we moved to Canada, and now I'm on, on a, uh, a Pentecostal church, which follows pretty much the same uh, the same uh, path. And, and Brazil is not a small country. It has 217 million people. A lot of people there. You know, we've been surrounded by Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, the rule is we can understand Spanish. We don't speak Spanish properly, but we can understand them. And for some reason, they can't understand us. I don't know how it goes, but it goes like that. But, uh, and we have our brothers south of the border, which is Argentina, which I'm, I'm cheering for, the World Cup, you know. We love that. And we have, uh, this is our flag, colorful, just like uh, uh, Leon's flag, full of colors. You know, and in 1944, 45, a lot of people just coming from other countries for variables reason. You know, so we all look different. There's no, you, you rarely will see one Brazilian that looks like your neighbor, his neighbor. Because we are, we come from different backgrounds. I have a Brazilian background. My wife has an Italian background, and, and there we go. We all over the place with that, you know. And then uh, we have also beaches. Beaches are very, very nice, but the water is not too warm. It's a bit cold. Unless you're in the north of Brazil, that's when the water is a bit warmer. You know, when we want to enjoy the beach, we don't go to Brazil. <laughs> we go to the Caribbean. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Oh, by the way, we've been a colony from uh, from Portugal since 1500 up to 1822. That when we uh, we uh, Portugal just left Brazil and we, we started ruling our own uh, country. Okay, so here we are. We have Crack the Redeemer. If you've been there from the from the Crack the Redeemer, you can see the whole city. You see the 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 city. We see the ocean. We see on the other side of the bay, which is a very nice. You know, I've been there a couple of times. And the beach Copacabana is also a very, very nice place to go to visit. Of course, the stadium, Maracanã Stadium. You know, it's uh, it's amazing to be there to watch a soccer game. You know, by the way, soccer came to Brazil in 1894. Guess who brought it? Charles Miller. It's, he was a British student in Sao Paulo. And uh, he showed the uh, soccer to the Brazilian and that's it. <laughs> We're still playing. <laughs> I think we like it. You know, it was very interesting story how he started training people there. And the story is very, 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 uh, very interesting. So nobody knew what it was. And but he knew how to play it. All the, the rules, you know, much have changed for sure. But uh, it was amazing. So here we are playing soccer. And there we go. I'm talking about soccer again. Oh, man. Okay, so we have the stadium. And we have a uh, lot of lights as well. 
you know, they say it, but this is the uh, more the Passover, you know, Christmas, I mean, uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, very, very, it's very nice to be by the beach to see that. And of course, we have the largest waterfall in the world. But I like our waterfall here. I immigrated to Canada in 1988. It's been a while. And some of the tradition there, I tell you, I, I forgot some of those. It's been a while. But I love our waterfall. I, I like the lighting. is amazing. And I like to have a winter and uh, during Christmas time. You know, snow, that's amazing. That's a perfect combination, you know. Moving on to the next slide. Of course, we have... Oh, look at that. Santa Claus going to the to the water. Brave, courageous man. And we have the food. We have turkey. Most of the food in uh, where I come from, they're Portuguese. So we have the bread here. They fry the bread. And, and turkeys and a lot of sweet stuff and salad. We're missing barbecue here, but I know it's not time for barbecue. It's Christmas. But this is pretty much what we have there. And Argentina, let's go. This is my take for Brazil. Bom Natal e Feliz Ano Novo. Thank you so much, ID. All right, thank you. Santa on the beach. Now we are moving to another continent, Africa. We'll start with Uganda. So Juliet Ajambo Doherty, Society Delegate of OPG. Welcome, Juliet. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me and, and my co-presenters. Uh, today, I'll be sharing with you what Christmas is like in Uganda, place of my birth and the place of my ancestors. Next slide. So Uganda is a landlocked country in the east of Africa. It has a area that's only about 2.4% the size of Canada, but has a population that is larger than Canada, so 49 million people. The official language is English, and the unofficial second language is uh, Swahili. Uganda used to be a uh, protectorate of the British Empire, but gained its independence in 1962. And unfortunately, like a lot of African countries, went through a period of having a dictator and now a very, very, very long serving president. Next slide, please. Uh, Ugandans are deeply religious uh, people who rely a lot on their faith and over 80% of the population identifies as being Christian, but like a lot of parts of the world, um, it's intermingled with indigenous faiths, um, with Islam and various other things. But because of the uh, large, affili large affiliation with Christianity, Christmas is an incredibly important holiday and widely celebrated throughout the country. Next slide, please. As with many nations around the world, uh, at Christmas time, you can expect to hear Christmas carols inside and out of churches, um, church bells being rung all across the country, homes and churches are uh, decorated with decorations and lit with Christmas lights or candles. Larger cities tend to have um, Christmas trees in squares, and there'll be processions. And most importantly to some is the advanced preparation of a traditional feast that will be served on Christmas day. Next slide, please. Um, the emphasis in Uganda is definitely more so on family and friends rather than on presents. Um, during the Christmas holidays, a lot of people um, make the commutes through the countryside, um, from the cities to the villages, oh, hey, to the villages of family and friends. And success in the big city is definitely measured by what you can bring back home to share with your uh, family and um, fellow people in your community or villages. Uh, things such as flour, sugar, petrol, things like that. Next slide, please. In addition, uh, focus is also given to uh, just giving and gratitude rather than receiving. And this is something that's not exclusive to people who have uh, lots of money. It's something that's just, it's understood to do. So it, it, it could be as simple as sharing a meal with someone or volunteering your time, volunteering to have both things or transport items for individuals, but definitely uh, a focus on giving and gratitude. Next slide, please. Now, the day of Christmas uh, is usually a light breakfast that is served um, with elements uh, that come from Indian um, tradition and cultures, such as chapati and samosas, because there used to be a large, and still is to a fair bit, um, population of uh, people who 
um, immigrated from India or are descended from uh, parents and family members from India. So it's a lighter breakfast and then it's off to the church to go, um, which is packed with family and friends. Next slide, please. And after church is the big Christmas feast. So um, like a lot of cultures around the world, um, there's people who still traditionally sit on the floor um, to have meals. And again, has nothing to do with being rich or poor, it just depends on how um, traditional the families still are. And as with the cultures around the world as well, some people um, eat with their hands and some still, and some use cutlery. But uh, traditionally speaking, I'll have matoke, which is uh, steamed green banana, not to be confused with plantain, um, potatoes, cassava, yam, ground nuts, and greens, and then depending on the affluence of the family, and the community, um, assorted types of meat. Next slide, please. And just as important to some is definitely what you're going to wear. People have a lot of emphasis on making sure they look good um, during the Christmas season. So uh, there's, you know, you can wear suits or more modern wear, but there's, there's an example of some of the traditional dress that you might see people wear. Uh, for gentlemen, you have the kanzu, which is um, either white or cream. And it's not to be confused with um, traditional Muslim dress. Next slide, please. Now, if you've had your fill of family or you have the money to do so, a lot of people will also escape for the holidays. So Uganda being where it's located, um, lots of animals, including the big five, so you can go on safari. Next slide, please. And for more adventurous, you can travel to Jinja, which is a source of the Nile, um, to do thrills such as uh, bungee jumping, so tandem or next slide, please. Sorry, solo or tandem. Uh, next, sorry, next again. And a certain other things. Next, 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 next. Um, and then there's additional things you can do in, in Uganda as well. So thank you for taking the time to learn about my country of birth. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Okay, Christmas tree. Another country in Nigeria, we are going to visit. So in going to welcome Onyi Onuma, society member from NWMO local. Go ahead, Onyi. Uh, thanks, Ali. Um, hope you can hear me, everyone. Um, my name is Oni. I work with the PMO, the Project Management Office in NWMO, uh, with the Project Control team. I'm happy to be here and listening to everyone sharing. I will tell you that I can see how we're all connected um, in Christmas and, of course, otherwise. Uh, I wanted to uh, share my experience um, Christmas in Nigeria. I wanted to start by greeting, uh, and I see everyone else has greeted um, Merry Christmas. Uh, that's what we say in Nigeria. We we say many Merry Christmas, but in Dewo is uh, just hello in my native language, which is Igbo. I'm from the southeastern part of Nigeria, but I grew up in Lagos, which is in the southwestern part. And because Nigeria is a very diverse uh, country, much like Canada, um, we have a language that everyone seems to understand, which is Pidgin English, broken English, um, a version of English. So that's why I put here how you did. So if you said something, if you met anyone that was Nigerian, you just say how you did, or even West African, they know what you're talking about and they'll probably reply, I did fine, I'm okay. Um, so <laughs> uh, going on, uh, I wanted to also share um, well, the, the flag of Nigeria is green, white, green. It's, I'm trying to draw parallels with Canada. Canada is red, white, red with the maple leaf in the middle. Um, but Nigeria is surrounded by the um, uh, French speaking countries, uh, Benin, Togo, Cameroon. Um, um, but we are Anglo speaking, we speak English there. So my memories, my fond memory, memories uh, of Christmas as a child, was um, first of all, we Christmas started way before 25th of, of, of December, and we will go uh, learn how to sing Christmas carols and go house hopping as kids and sing in front of uh, their balconies or their doors and they come out and then hand you money preferably or they invite you over to have a dinner, it's usually in the evening. But we also had a change of weather uh, around Christmas, which is Hamatan, which was cold, cold air, very low humidity and um, foggy as well. So people's skins dried out. So that was our version of the white Christmas. And I grew up listening to, <laughs> I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. I was like, okay. Um, anyway, so um, since we, I did most of my Christmas, I spent most of my Christmas in the city, but my people, the Igbo people usually go 
uh, much like Juliet said, go from the city to the village and there's a massive show off of what, you, <laughs> what you've achieved in the city. My family was not really big on that, but in Lagos, um, what we did uh, was we went for night vigil. Uh, we're Catholic background, so we went for night vigil, and it was really fun for me as a kid because um, that was the one time we were allowed legally to stay up overnight. Uh, so we'd be walking back home amidst uh, knockouts, uh, fireworks um, going on, and then we would sleep for a few hours, wake up on Christmas Day, and cook. Cook, cook, cook. It was the time you had to cook like four square meals, three square meals, whatever. And jello fries had to be at the center of it. So that's what I'm showing here. There was always coleslaw, salad, and most well, well to do families killed a chicken. What you know, you just have to buy the live chicken and kill it for Christmas. You leave it tied up somewhere for most of the Christmas uh, time. So that's uh, those are the memories I had uh, growing up. But um, as I grew up as a teenager and a young uh, young woman, that we also had to go into the city and see these lights, uh, you know, streets uh, with Christmas lights all turned up. And uh, also, there there is currently one of the biggest, I think, the biggest carnival in in maybe West Africa. It's in Calabar. It's not in Lagos, and that's what I'm trying to show here. Um, so uh, food, food, food. Uh, I think we can skip over the next um, the next slide because I've said most of what is on there. Um, yeah, so that's basically um, how we spent our Christmas. But thank you, Soli, for uh, Chris. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Have, have a happy holidays and Merry Christmas again. Thank you, Oni. I think uh, we are going to cover the very last uh, country for this trip. In Middle East, Christmas in Syria by Amjad Farah, Society member with OPG Local. Go ahead, Amjad. Are you there? No? Maybe, Sally, we go to you. All right. So, Indonesia, pretty much uh, like uh, we all mentioned, going to church uh, celebration 24th of December is a big deal went to church to hear the uh, Christmas uh, Christmas bells that's always to be that's always uh, interesting uh, other than that uh, we talk about food uh, Indonesian food is uh, spicy and it's a mixture of uh, Indian culture and Chinese because Indonesia was a meeting place for the ancient Chinese civilization and ancient Indian because they were separated by the Himalayan mountains. The way to say Merry Christmas in our language is Selamat Hari Natal. With that, let me call Amjad one more time if he is there. Amjad, are you there? If not, I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for such a great celebration of Christmas around the world. Merry Christmas, Buon Natale, Feliz Navidad, Learned that Father Christmas on a flatbed truck in in Guyana, uh, Santa Lucia in uh, Sweden, and it has been a very enriching multicultural celebration, the best yet uh, I have experienced. Thank you so much. And now a closing remark by our host, Society Unit Director Leon Simeon. Go ahead, Leon. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, next slide, please. So this uh, presentation has been brought to you by the Coalition of Racialized Professionals and Allies. Um, I'd like to thank all the presenters, our MC, Solly, our Executive Vice President, Chris, who's um, been helping us uh, through uh, through this and has been kind of a, a little techy, um, and everyone who's joined us here today from near and far. I'd like to wish everyone a safe, happy, and healthy holiday seasons. Merry Christmas, everyone.